morning family how y'all doing what's happening y'all what's happening it's going down y'all already know it's you know. patrice and of course ryan and we're coming to you live right here at the potter's house of fort worth oh, yeah. and bro i'm so excited about this morning oh, about man. what god has to say yes me too this is my first time here in 2022 listen it's my first time welcome to 2022 welcome bro. To 20 oh no. my goodness here we no. go listen did you hear pastor winfield last week oh. just sharing about rebuilding vision Man, it was a phenomenal word, yo. Listen, if you all did not get an opportunity to check out the word last week, go back. Go back. Do the replay. Yeah. You want to make sure you got your good Bible handy because yeah. you also want to do some study yeah. and peruse the word of God and let it build you up because yeah. I'm telling you, that word is going to build your life and yes. it's going to make a lasting impression on your yeah. life. It did for me, bro. Man, yes. so what we got coming up? Listen, we got a lot of things coming up here in 2020. Um, the first thing is we want to remind you all that our elders and ministers are in the Zoom prayer rooms ready to pray with you and to pray for you and to touch and agree. You know, the Bible says where two or three are gathered in agreement, God is in the midst. Yeah. And that's what we want to, for God to be in the midst of everything Absolutely. that we're doing together. Hey, y'all, and don't forget, next week coming up, actually, it's not next week, but next month, yeah. we got the Mobile Food Pantry finally returning oh, yeah. to the Potter's House on our campus, so 9 a.m. the first Saturday in February. Make sure you get your people, mm -hmm. get your bags, get your trunks open, get and ready. let's get ready. We're ready to serve our community. What else we got, bro? We also have our student ministry fire yeah, culture. Yes, you sir. Know. You see the jacket. You, already you know. see it. It's going down. It's going down. We have our Wednesday night Bible studies that'll be online, snacks, and who? 
Jesus. It's already going down. And next Sunday, I want y'all to get ready. The word is going to be hot. We're coming to you live yes. on our YouTube channel and on Instagram live. So get, get ready, y'all. Ready, it's going down. What else we got? We also got open house. Open house is coming. Parents, we need to see you on the 30th of January in the firehouse. Yes, yes. I said it. The renovation is almost done. Yes. But even before it's done, we need to have you come in so we can share with you all that that's going down in Everything. 2022. Yes. Well, bro, it's about that time. It Service is about is. to start. Come on, before we get there, y'all, good morning. We see you in the chat, Avonda Triplett. But listen, Holy Spirit, have your way. We ask that you will minister to the minister needs of the God. people in the hospitals, the cars, yes, and wherever they are. Yes, it's God. in Jesus' in name Jesus we pray. Name. Amen. Amen. shall rejoice and be glad in it. Would you help me rejoice in the great Savior, the amazing Father, the everlasting King? Come on, open up your mouth and give the God of angel armies worship this morning. Somebody shout hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I came to encourage you this morning. I came to let you know that whatever God is going to do, it's going to be big. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I know you got expectations, but I need you to think bigger. I need you to turn to another neighbor and say, neighbor, I know you got dreams, but I need you to dream bigger. Does anybody know that we serve a big God that can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think? Somebody shout, it's gonna be big. It's gonna be big. Hallelujah. Let's give him glory in the house this morning. Hey, oh. Uh, You believe it's safe? God, we are declaring this year, this moment, you are doing big. Great things, God. Say, I believe. Yes, God. That it's my season. That it's my season. Hallelujah. Somebody shout it out. Say, I believe. I believe. Declare it over yourself and say, it's my time. That it's my time. And I can feel it. Breakthrough is in the room. Breakthrough is in the room. Yes, God. And I, I'm anticipating. Yes, God. God's getting ready to move. If you believe that, lift those hands up and say, For I know my God is working a miracle just for me.
The same God that he was, he is, and he shall be. And so if he was a healer, he is a healer, and he shall be a healer. If he was a way maker, he is a way maker, and he shall be a way maker. And I said, when you really start to think about it, there are times that God has done things and ways God has made that we forgot to say thank you for. So just for a few seconds, can we just open up our mouth and say thank you? Because I know there are promises, God, you have kept. Because if you were a promise keeper, you are a promise keeper. And you shall be a promise keeper. And you haven't stopped being God. You haven't stopped being good. You'll never stop being faithful. You'll never stop being the king of glory. You'll never stop being El Shaddai. And so God, we thank you right now for who you are. We thank you, God, for what you've done. God, right now I owe you a thank you. I owe you a hallelujah. And I bless your name. And I give you praise.
because I know you're the same God that used to in the middle in the middle of service they would see demons cast out and folks that walk in lame leave leaping I want to watch you do it again Y'all gotta know me. I said, not that you can't do it on your time, God. But it sure would be nice to see it in service. So I need some folks with some faith to believe with me. It's fine if you don't have the faith. Listen, my husband's here. I got one. That's all I need. God, one more. It sure would be nice. But you need to say it out of your mouth. Believe in your heart. That God is gonna do it again. And you gotta declare it with some attitude. Now I know some folks are saying, but Brit, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how to have faith for that. Cool. I'm not going to say fake it till you make it. I'm going to say face it till you make it. Because the Bible has already said that life, death, lies in the power of your tongue. So you got to face that and believe your God. Listen, y'all got to handle that out. Work out your own soul salvation. Because I'm going to tell you it works. Even if you believe it or not. Because God works. Period. Quite like simple. And so I need you to say it with some attitude. And like I told the praise team with some swag. Get that thing on your mind. Y'all already ain't where y'all rock at. I need a rock. I need a rock. Uh-huh. I need you to say it with a little attitude. And I need you to say it with a little stink. I don't care what the mountain is.
acknowledge the fact that God has not stopped being God I just want to make that just that simple claim and take a moment to just ponder on the fact on the truth of what we know which is he is the same God yesterday today that means right now and tomorrow that means in your future he has not questionable people whether or not they're going to follow through they've made promises and broke them and they've, they've broken our heart but the God that we serve oh my God he is such a faithful God if you're watching online know that he is such a faithful God his love is unfailing the Bible says there is nothing that will stop him from loving us there's nothing that will stop him from getting to us wherever you are whatever we're going through there is nothing that will stop God from being God can we just honor God for being the God of our oh my God the, the Lord of our life uh, what's that what's that one what you can do uh-huh and so i won't stop i won't stop praising you now because i know what because you can I do because i know that's the part right there i won't stop because i know i just want to build somebody's confidence right now some of us know but we forgot because of what we're going through but can i remind you that we serve a good god we serve a mighty oh, god wait. he is lord strong and mighty Mighty in battle, he's never lost a fight, and he ain't gonna start today. Hey. Uh, whatever your worship looks like, just take a moment. Even if you are, if you are quiet worship, and you do all your worship on the inside, yeah. But if you don't worship on the inside, worship with confidence, knowing that we serve a God who is greater than what we're facing.
Everybody, welcome. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. You all can have your seats. If you're online, welcome. We are so delighted to have you all with us and watching. If you're online, take a quick moment to share this stream, share this live service, because you don't want to miss what God is about to do this morning. Listen, we have a, a, a special presentation. Um, there's a video that uh, we're going to uh, go to real quick, and then um, I have some announcements and a few things that I want to rehearse with you immediately after the video. So if you're in the house, pay attention to the monitors, um, and if you're watching online, just keep watching the screen, and I'll be back in just a moment. Today we celebrate a great man, a man who had incredible vision and dreams that could only be accomplished through faith and remarkable works. This man is that one man who literally changes the world. Yes, today we celebrate Dr. King for his birthday and for creating a blueprint of legacy. Today we also realize that it's our responsibility to carry out his vision and it starts with me. Exercising my right to vote and fighting new voting laws in a system that tries to gerrymander my voice. It starts with me. Continuing to educate my kids and the students in my community about critical race theory and their history, while our home state legislatures continue to abolish it in our school systems. It starts with me. Knowing that I can also be the first black anything, I dream big because it starts with me. Buying back my family's 40 acres of farmland helps me provide fresh foods in our community, crayons in our classrooms, and continuing to help strengthen our global economy during a pandemic. It starts with me. Thank you, Dr. King, for the blueprint you created and for allowing us to understand the foundation of your legacy. As we continue to carry it on, we understand it continues with us. Amen. Amen. Can we give God praise for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? No, you can do better than that. What he really did is he showed us that we have freedom no matter where we are, no matter what our situation looks like. And I just want to encourage you all that the legacy lies within us. The future of freedom and the continuation of freedom for not just us, but for everyone in the world, it lies with us. That's our responsibility to keep that forward. So I encourage you guys in any way possible that you can find a way to, to, to continue to allow freedom to ring in your life and in every situation, no matter where you are. Amen. Listen, um, just a few announcements that I want to rehearse with you all. Wednesday night Bible studies will resume Wednesday, January 19th. Wednesday night Bible studies, and we have an opportunity where Pastor Winfield will go and deeper into the word and really break it down in such a way that it's so easy to receive the word of God and understand it um, in a new way that you may not have been able to understand it before and on a new level. And that's important when we're serving a God so great as the God that we serve, you know, to understand him to the greatest depth of who he is. And uh, Wednesday night Bible study is where we have the opportunity to, to learn of that for ourselves uh, by from no, uh, none other than Pastor Winfield, our campus pastor. Um, so January 19th, tune in at 7 p.m. It's going to be online only, okay? So at 7 p.m., make sure you uh, log in to your Instagram. Uh, I'm sorry, your, your Instagram um, and your Facebook um, because that's where we're going to be, all right? Um, save the date for our first mobile food pantry of 2022. Um, that's happening um, on the first Saturday in February, on February the 5th. That's from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. So make sure to save, make sure you all save that date once again for our mobile food, for the first mobile food pantry of this year. It is happening on Saturday, February the 5th on at 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. All right. Um, and finally, uh, all throughout this pandemic, we've been having um, small groups 
um, for our teenagers, for our men's ministry, for our marriage ministries, including um, small groups and Bible studies for our student ministry down, um, with the fire culture. And we want to encourage you all to get connected and stay connected um, so that we can continue to minister to you and serve you the way we've been able to serve you all throughout the years. Um, for more information about those small groups, um, you, we definitely want to encourage you to download our app. That's right. We do have a Potter's House of Fort Worth app that you can go to your app store and uh, download it just like you do any other app. And when you download it, you'll receive notifications about any updates or, or upcoming events um, or anything that you need to change um, that's going, or any changes that you need for you to expect so that you can know what you're going to be getting every time you come here at the Potter's House of Fort Worth. Um, and if uh, that doesn't work for you, just remember you can always go, also go online um, and go to tphfw.org to get more information as well um, on the upcoming events and things that all of those small groups are having. Amen. Um, it is now offering time. Yes, yes, that is a good place to praise God. During offering time, we have the opportunity to uh, give towards our future. Give towards what's next to us, what, what's next for us. Um, and I just want to, I, I normally work with the students, so I just want to make giving very simple. And this is, because this is really what I love about giving is like, if we go, we serve the God of increase, right? Which means he can take whatever we give him, whether it be your time, talent, or your treasure, and he'll take it and being the God of increase, he'll bless it and, and increase it into whatever it is that you need. And so I just want to encourage everybody in this moment, young, old, or in between, whatever, that in this moment of giving, I want you to understand who you're giving to, the God of increase. And that he, being the God of increase, will accept whatever you give him, time, talent, treasure. And whatever you give, based on your heart, God will take it, he'll bless it, and he'll increase it. And I'm going to speak for myself. I don't know about you all, but I'm looking for God to give me an increase in 2022. I'm not going to wait till the later, but I'm looking for God to give me an increase at the, at, from the beginning of 2022 to the end of 2022. And so I encourage you to get in on this, on this opportunity to give and to sow a seed so that you can get into your increase that God has for you. Amen. Um, so with that being said, our praise team is going to lead us into another song. And then immediately after that, after that we are going to bless the offering and we're going to give. Um, and we're going to keep rocking with Jesus. Y'all ready? Can y'all make some noise for Jesus one more time? Songwriter wrote, and because God is the greatest power, we shall never ever be defeated and because God is the greatest power we shall never ever be defeated I shall rise I shall be I shall go in victory, no weapon for against me will ever overtake me. No weapon formed against me. It can't you ever overtake me. Here is why. And because God is the greatest power. Is the greatest power. As we prepare for the word, we shall never let's make this declaration together. Be and because God. And it's the greatest power. It's the greatest power. Then we shall never, we shall never ever, be ever be defeated. If you know that you are more than a conqueror, and lift those hands up. Oh. 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 Even 
whatever tries to come against you, it has to bow in the name of Jesus. If you believe that, say, oh, 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 oh. yes, God. Let's say that again. Make that decla declaration. Say, I shall be. And wherever I go, I walk in victory.
God victory, I need you to give God praise right there. If you know that you win, I need you to give God praise right there. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Standing on your feet, please. I want to worship the Lord in giving. There is something powerful when we all gather together to worship in this manner. Sometimes the reason why giving is so tedious and so arduous for some of us is because we have the tendency to forget just how great God is and how he is never defeated never defeated I am quite sure that all principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places were slapping each other high fives when Jesus was walking down the road, the Villa de Rosa, towards Calvary. And I'm quite sure that they were all excited that they were able to take the Son of God and nail him to a cross. And I'm quite, I'm quite sure that all devils in hell started celebrating because they thought they had a victory and I'm quite sure that the saints of the most high got depressed because it looked like it looked like God himself had fell but they didn't know or understand that the wisdom of God sometimes causes for you to look like you're losing even though you're winning <laughs> The Bible says in, in 1 Corinthians, the, the first chapter, that if they would have known the plans of God, then they would not have crucified him because the crucifixion was a part of the plan. What I'm trying to get somebody to understand is just because it looks like you're losing, it doesn't mean that you're losing. It could mean that you're winning. Because God is the greatest power. He will never be defeated. I know what it looks like. I know what it feels like. But he will never be defeated. Never. Never. He shall never, never be defeated. The Bible declares that, and I'm going to talk about it in just a moment, when the Jews were coming back from Babylon into Jerusalem and they had within their hearts a stirred up heart to rebuild the temple that God gave them a vision a God-given vision a God-given inspiration to be able to go back and to rebuild the temple Ezra to rebuild the temple and, and, and Nehemiah to rebuild the temple walls and all of them are going back but this is the part that's just powerful God never releases them into their assignment without resources. <laughs> so the people were stirred to give to them while they were going back. Stirred to give while they were moving. Stirred to give so that while they were going through the provinces, people start coming out of their houses and say, here, take this with you. 
They're just moving towards vision and destiny, and people are just coming out the neighborhood. Just, hey, take this with you. Hey, there's something else. Hey, I've got some gold here. Hey, I got some silver here. Hey, I got some stuff here. I got some stuff. I don't, I don't know if you need it, but I, I just want to give it to you anyway because I see something that is moving towards God's destiny. And anything that's moving towards God's destiny, they got the understanding and the revelation that it is a blessing for you to give and to sow into that which is moving towards what God, God's will is. I don't know about you, but I thank God for the opportunity to sow into what is moving oh God look at somebody and say it's moving it's moving it's moving it's moving and what I love about God is that whatever you make happen in his house oh my God, he'll make happen in your house yeah. If you're watching and streaming on live, I want you to get your tithe and your offering ready. Oh God, everybody get your tithe and offering ready. We're going to make some declarations. Remember, remember, remember uh, the power of life and death is in your tongue and those that eat uh, love it shall eat the fruit thereof. All right. We, we're going to make some declarations over this word. We're going to make some declarations over this seed and make some declarations over your offering, over your tithe. We're going to make some declarations over your money. Somebody say, my money. My money. And because God... It's the greatest power. We shall never, never be defeated. Oh God. Even in your finances. See, that's the declaration that you make. And because God is the greatest power, we shall never, never be defeated. If you're streaming on live, if you're here, listen, you can text uh, text to give. The information is on the screen. If you have our, our Potter's House of Fort Worth app, uh, you can go to the bottom of that screen and, and just press on that heart button, and then it'll take you right into the push pay prompt. If you are texting to 28950, text to 28950, and then put PHF space and whatever dollar amount that God has placed in, placed in your heart to give. If you are writing checks out, writing out to the Potter's House of Fort Worth or TPHFW, amen, and you spell million, M-I-L-L-I-O-N, billion, B-I-L-L-I-O-N, yeah, yeah, sometimes you got to get in practice. Oh, y'all don't hear me. I don't have no believers in here. I don't have no believers in here. Have you ever wrote, written out a check? Just, just, I'm going to take this check and write out a million because I want to practice. Just put it in your Bible. Don't, don't, don't catch it. Don't. <laughs> if, you, if it ain't in the bank, don't catch it. But, but you just put it in the Bible. Just, Lord, Lord I'm believing God. I'm believing you for it. Amen. I'm gonna stretch that tithe and offering up before the Lord. Repeat after me. Say, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to give. Thank you for the opportunity to sow. Now, Lord, I decree and declare that this seed is an act of my worship, my obedience, my love towards you. And Father, I believe that I receive back in good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. I thank you, oh God, that because I sow into a progressive vision, Thank you, Lord, that you sow back into me. Father, thank you for favor, supernatural, uncommon favor over my faith, over my family, over my finances, and over my future. And if you believe that you receive supernatural, uncommon favor, I want everybody to open up your mouth and say, I got favor in Jesus' name over every area of my life. Come on, put your hands together and give God glory and praise for that. Amen. Amen. You can have your seats in the presence of the Lord. If you use an envelope this morning, just pass your, your tithe and offering down to the person at far left or our PMTs are going to come around and serve you. If that's you, just do that. Everybody else, just sit tight. Man, what a day. One of the things that I think is very important as we traverse through these times is that we understand that no matter 
how things look. God is always up to something. Yeah? Yeah? That God is always up to something. Now, there's a word with your name on it, and I, I'm, going to, I'm going to pray in just a moment, and I, I thank and praise God for the opportunity that we could celebrate uh, such a powerful man, Dr. Martin Luther King, today. Come on, come on, let's praise God for Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, isn't it interesting that the further and further along we go in life, the further and further we get away from the work that somebody has done, the more that the accolade loses its luster. <laughs> I, I, I think that there is something to be said for the work that he did, for the sacrifices that he made, he and his family made, just so that our civil rights can be acknowledged and I, our civil rights as a people uh, can be highlighted and certainly exercised. And I don't take it for granted that somebody would sacrifice their life to do something like that. Would sacrifice their young years to do something like that. He was in his early 30s. And while there are many people right now under the sound of my voice or, or many people who are all over the world right now in their early 30s that are playing video games instead of fighting for somebody else's rights. He could have been doing anything at that age. But he felt the clarion call to be able to fight for our rights because the cause needed a spokesperson and a voice. And God anointed his voice to do something great. God anointed his voice to be able to give us the opportunity to gather. And I thought it was very interesting that... Uh, that the hostage situation would happen in the synagogue and that people are in a very deranged state. That they don't look at the houses of God anymore as places and spaces of prayer, but places and spaces of desperation. And it's because sometimes we lose respect for what God has done even through people. So with that in mind, can you do me a favor? Can you act like Dr. King <laughs> has just come from a Montgomery, Alabama march and just received the victory, a victory that afforded you the opportunity to vote, a victory that afforded you the opportunity to do something that you couldn't do before. And can we praise God for the life and the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Amen. 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 Remain on your feet. Remain on your feet. Father, we love you and thank you so much for this day and all the time that you've given to us. I come before you today because I know that there is a word that must be delivered, a word that must be spoken, a word that must be received as well as taught. So I pray in the name of Jesus, Father, that you would bless the hearts and the minds of your people, Father, and even as we are gathering to rebuild our lives. I pray that you would give us the wisdom, empowerment to do so. I pray, oh God, that you would think through my thoughts and speak through my words and help me to articulate with passion and grace the things that are on your heart and on your mind in the name of Jesus. I pray, oh God, that you would speak to your people supernatural ancient truths, oh God, that would be prevalent and relevant for the times that we are living in today. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And thank God. Amen. Let's go to the Word of God. If you have your Bibles, please stand for me or with me with, to the reading or for the reading of God's Word. I'm going to be reading the book of Ezra, the third chapter, verses 10 through 13. And then I'm going to flip over to Haggai and read chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. Ezra chapter 3, uh, verses 10 through 13. And Haggai chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. 
Amen. 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 It's a big day. God bless you. We're praying. God bless you. I ain't going to say nothing. My wife told me, told me not to say nothing. She's on her way uh, to Cleveland uh, to help uh, uh, mother in, in the Lord and her mother in love to, uh, to pack up and to move. And so, amen, before, before she got out the car, she said, now, listen, don't you say nothing about the Cowboys. And don't you say nothing about the Lakers. No, I, just I was just telling you what she told me not to say. Ezra, the third chapter, <laughs> verses 10 through 13. When you got it, say, I got it. Listen to the word of the Lord. Now when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord according to the directions of King David of Israel. And they sang praises, and, uh, and they sang praising and giving thanks to the Lord, saying, for he is good, for his favor is upon Israel forever. And all the people shouted with a great shout of joy when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Somebody say, the foundation was laid. Chapter, uh, verse 12, yet many of the priests and Levites and the heads of fathers' households, the old men who had seen the first temple wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, while many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the shout of joy from the sound of the weeping of the people because the people were shouting with a loud shout and the sound was heard far away. They came to rebuild the temple, but they didn't wait until the temple was fully finished. They praised God at the laying of the foundation. They praised God at the laying of the foundation and when the old heads saw that the foundation did not look anything like what it used to be, their praise was not a praise of progress. Their praise was a praise of grief. And isn't it interesting that everybody could be praising but everybody is not praising for the same reasons. Hmm. Uh, flip over to Haggai, chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. Listen to what it says, because Haggai is a prophet that is prophesying concerning this rebuilding of, of the temple. And he says, on the 21st of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? Are you looking at what I'm doing right now and calling it nothing in comparison to what I've done in times past? I'm God. Verse 4, but now take courage, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Take courage also, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and all you people of the land, take courage, declares the Lord, and work. Somebody holler out, work. Mm -hmm. For I am with you, declares the Lord of armies. 
And as for the promise which I made you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Do not fear, for this is what the Lord of armies says. Once more in a little while, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also, and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and, and they will come with the wealth of all nations, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of armies. Verse 8, the silver is mine, and the gold is mine declares the Lord of armies the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former says the Lord of armies and in this place somebody holler out and say in this place in this place I will give peace it don't look like nothing but in this place I'm gonna give peace it don't look like nothing right now but in this place I'm going to give peace, declares the Lord of the armies. The word of the Lord is blessed in your hearing of it, in your our reading of it, and in the doing of it. I want to talk today from this thought, rebuilding people, rebuilding people. And if you came with somebody today, I want you to give them a fist bump and let them know what we're talking about today. Tell them, tell them the preacher talking about rebuilding people, and that means you and me. You can have your seats in the presence of the Lord. If you're worshiping with us for the first time, this is your first time here at the Potter's House of Fort Worth, let me see you by waving your hand. Uh, is there any first time guests? I see you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Come on, let's praise God for all of our first time guests and visitors, guests and friends. We thank and praise God for you. And uh, certainly do, certainly do count it an honor and a privilege uh, to be worshiping with you today. Now, if we were not in the COVID situation, you would have been bombarded with all kinds of hugs from everywhere, from every direction, because that's our way of saying that we love you, we love you, we love you with the love of the Lord. Rebuilding people. I was, I was thinking about this, this word and... <laughs> My, my mind is kind of, because my wife says, you know, you have watched too much TV growing up. You know, you, <laughs> I mean, just too much. But as a result, you know, I, I get messages through a lot of the stuff that I've watched. And, and, and when I was, I, was, I was listening to this word and, and hearing it in my spirit, reverberate in my spirit. And then there was an image that popped up in my head. <laughs> it was something, it was a blast from the past in the 70s. Come on, man. You say way back? She said way back. Way back. Way back when? When graphics were still trying to be figured out. And I thought it would be apropos to show as a lead-in to what we're going to talk about today. Check this out. Gentlemen, we can rebuild him. We have the technology. We have the capability to make the world's first bionic man. Steve Austin will be that man. Better than he was before. Better. Stronger. Faster. So, so without aging yourself, how many of y'all remember that? Six minutes, okay, all right. So, so it is the story or the narrative of a man that was an astronaut. He tries to go out of space, but it goes wrong. His module, his pod comes crashing back down to Earth. Comes crashing back down to Earth. He is, he is typically broken a broken individual, eye, arms, legs, 
all of those particular parts of the body are lost within this crash. And so he needs to be rebuilt. But the science and the technology has changed and shifted. Because in times past, they would not have had the technology to be able to rebuild him according to what they have already created such that he could become better. Because without the technology, he would probably would have died. But the technology, as it were, at that particular time, uh, was one that they would be able to rebuild him, but not necessarily back the way that he was. Because whenever things are broken, it can never be the same. <laughs> so when you rebuild it, you're going to have to rebuild it with the idea, with the understanding that it will never be like it used to be. <laughs> you, you, you're, you're not going to be able to be the same person that you used to be. You went through a traumatic experience, and you will never be able to go back to the person that you used to be. So instead of crying over what was lost, they started to impart to him the necessary parts that he needed, not just for his present situation, but what he was going to need for future circumstances. So they gave him a new eye, vision. Vision that was going to be able to see further than what he was able to see before. And they gave him new arms. Ability. The ability to be able to be stronger in places where he was never strong before. And, and, and he gave him new legs. Mobility. The ability to be able to move faster than what he had moved before. And before long, he was a different person, but he had to go through a traumatic experience. And if you judge your future by your past traumas, you will miss all the things that God is changing in you to make you better, to make you wiser, to make you stronger, to make you faster. I don't know who I'm talking to today in here, but I heard God say to teach this lesson to us about rebuilding people because after this trauma, after this pandemic, everybody is going to be different. Everybody. There is no person under the sound of my voice that will ever be the same. Well, one of my friends, one of my friends uh, uh, reached out and he said, he said, Pastor, I've never seen something like this. Well, it, well, it was on Facebook, via Facebook. He said, he said uh, that uh, his wife that works in the ER never seen so many young people come in because they're having nervous breakdowns. I'm not talking about broken legs. I'm not talking about broken limbs. I'm not talking about damaged uh, anatomy parts. I am talking about a damaged and broken mind. And oftentimes we don't understand that we can come back to church, we can come back to worship, we can come back from a traumatic experience but we think that we are the same, and the reality of it is that you're not. I'm not. Look at somebody and say, you will never be the same. T tell somebody behind it, and I know, I know you got the mask on, but let them read your eyes. Tell them, you will never be the same. You will, you will never be the same. You're watching and streaming on live. You will never be the same. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to tell you, you will never be the same. You're not the same person that you were. No, I'm sorry. This is not the same generation that was pre-COVID. I'm sorry. You will never be the same. Your relationships will never be the same. How you look at the world will never be the same. 9-11, when that tragedy happened, it changed us all. People were never the same. You can't even go to the airport again the same. Everything shifts. Everything changes because, because God has a way of rebuilding people. Now, let's go to the text. Now, when we look at, when we look at, at worship, there, there, there seems to be a connection between the worship of people and the place of worship. That the worship of people and the place of worship is, is a place or a sign that there is a connection between both of them. So, so, so when you are looking at the Old Testament and talking about building temples, you think that it's talking about a place of worship. 
when ultimately God is talking about a people of worship. <laughs> because the place of worship is a sign and extension of the people of worship. Okay. And oftentimes, we put a lot of money, a lot of effort in the place. And we don't put a lot of value in the people. Uh, let, me, let me explain to you uh, uh, plainly. Uh, see, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is not the building. The address of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is not 1270 Woodhaven Boulevard. That's the building. Uh, but, but, uh, but I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about where you live, not where the church is. Uh, because you are the building. Somebody say, I am the building. God has no problems, watch, in, in allowing for a building to become uh, 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 desecrated or dilapidated as long as the people are still built up. This is the reason why God had no problems with allowing for the temple that was built by Solomon to be destroyed by the Babylonians. He had no issue. He was not tripping on that because, because the silver is his, the gold is his, and whatever the temple was and whatever Whatever the temple had, he was not defined by the stuff that was in the temple. He's the one that create and recreate the stuff that was lost in the fire and lost in the, dis dis the, the flood and lost in the destruction. He is God like that. What he wants to know is, are the people okay? And as the people were leaving from Babylon, as the temple of Solomon was being destroyed, there was always a plan of God to rebuild the people. Because the temple being under such scrutiny was really a sign that the people had left him. Stay with me. Whatever happened to the temple had already happened to the people. The temple was destroyed. And if you read the book of Jeremiah, especially toward the end of the book of Ezekiel, you will understand that the children of Israel had went away from God and they had, they had begun to worship false idols and they had begun to, to walk away from God. And, and the, the Bible says they went a whoring after other gods. They, 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 they prostituted themselves out and they were not the people that God created them to be. And so now they had already left God. So they were just looking at the temple, going to the temple because the temple was a form of their worship, but their true worship they did not participate in because when it came time to glorify God in their bodies, when it came time to glorify God with their lives, they didn't glorify God, but they came to church. <laughs> because they thought by just coming to church that that was enough and that God was more interested in you coming to church, but God says, I'll burn it down. <laughs> to let you know that it had nothing to do with the building. It had everything to do with my personal relationship with you. Where are you in your relationship with God? This is the narrative of the rebuilding of people. 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 Not things. We've become masters in so many different things. We've mastered, we've mastered technology. We, we've mastered, we've mastered uh, uh, YouTube, and we've mastered how to, how to surf on the web. We've mastered so many different things. But one of the things that we have not mastered is people. I was talking with my son the other day, and I was, I, and I was, and I was, I was asking him the question. I said, I said, do you feel like your generation is going to be um, 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 able to interact with each other when they get older because we spend so much time in technology and so much time uh, on the cell phone that you don't understand that the uncomfortability that you feel when you are around people is an opportunity for you to deal with something that is going to help you and make you better. But if you always run away from the uncomfortability of being engaged with people to your cell phones so that you never have to engage with people face to face, but you always have a screen to go as an in-between and a screen between you and people, then you will never understand that God is trying to build you without your technology because what are you without your technology? That's good. That's good, 
Can you have a conversation with me and not your phone? Or do you spend more time on your phone than you do connecting with people? Or are you more comfortable with connecting to people through your phone? Then you are in just connecting with people. And then what is it that is causing for you to have this kind of anxiety and insecurity that you cannot connect with people or interact or engage with people as if you're going to be able to live your life without engaging with people in some way, shape, form, or fashion? And if we're not careful, we're going to raise up a generation that is great at technology but has a huge ineptitude at connecting and engaging with human beings. So they will become more comfortable in engaging with technology, more comfortable in finding love in technology versus dealing with the complexities of finding love in a human being. Woo-wee! It's quiet in this Catholic church. Have we become so separated from each other that we don't know that we're losing each other because we have disconnected from each other and while the person that's sleeping up under your roof is going through all kinds of trauma, do you understand that they are being destroyed in their head, in their minds, in their lives and yet and still you're walking around them like they don't exist? I want to ask you today, what needs to be rebuilt in your life? What has been lost? Through everything that we have gone through, what has been lost that needs to be rebuilt? Some some people have gone through traumatic experiences with people, and so they've got to rebuild their faith and trust in people. Isn't it interesting that we don't trust each other even though we need each other? God has made it so that we cannot be everything that we're supposed to be without each other. That the church can't even grow. That we can't, we can't grow if we are not together. And, 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 and yet and still, and yet and still, instead of working on the things that we need to work on, we decide to just separate and divide ourselves and not even speak to each other when we need each other. How does that work? How does that work when the kids say, I'm not going to speak to you as my parent? How long is that going to be? What what, what is that going to be like if the parent says, I'm not going to speak to my child anymore? What is that that like when we say those kinds of things? I know I've said it. I know you've said it. And we all have have said it at some point. But I want you to understand the uh, the, uh, the, the idioticness of this, that that, that this 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 is something that we have got to walk away from that because we are called to connect with each other. We're called to study each other so that we can rebuild each other. And I want to give you certain principles that's going to help you not just to rebuild you, but to rebuild the people around you because nobody under the sound of my voice will ever be the same. How do we rebuild this thing? How do we build, rebuild our relationships? How do we rebuild? Some, how do we rebuild our lives? How do we rebuild our families? How do we rebuild our cities? How do we rebuild our neighborhoods? How do we rebuild our churches, our synagogues? You cannot go through a hostage situation and think you're going to be the same. Now there are certain things that need to change. Now it's going to be an upscale security now. Can you deal with that? Or are you going to still be living in the past? I want to give you four things. Four keys, some sub points in every key, but some, four keys that's going to help us to be able to rebuild people. Uh, The first thing that I want you to know is that rebuilding people starts from what is left. (laughs) What is left. Uh, The Bible says that when Ezra and the rest of the priests came into uh, uh, Jerusalem, that they they did an assessment, they did an inventory about about the temple that had already been destroyed, and they saw that 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 stuff was just left there. It was was destroyed, it was burnt to death, it was rubble everywhere, and so now they had to take an inventory of what was destroyed because they hadn't been back since the Babylonian captivity. And and, and that was 70 years, 70 years prior to. Now they're coming back 70 years later, and now they've got to take an inventory because they got a call to rebuild something, but before you rebuild it, you got to take an inventory of what it is that you have left because some things are able to be salvaged, but other things have to be thrown away. 
And you got to know that there's some things in your life that can be salvaged, but there's some things that needs to be thrown away. You've got to take inventory, personal inventory. You got to see what do you have left? What do you have left? The Bible says that Nehemiah, when he was released from, uh, from, uh, from Babylon, that he rode into Jerusalem and he took three days to ride around the city just so he can check the walls and inspect the walls. And the Bible says that before he told anybody the, what the Spirit of God told him in his mind, before he released what was in his mind to do, he did some self inflection. He investigated. He examined. He looked at what was wrong. Before he said anything, he looked at what was wrong. And our problem is we talk too fast without thinking and looking and investigating about what is wrong. You want to judge people before you have the ability and the wisdom to be able to investigate and test and examine and, oh God, and assess people and evaluate people. You judge people too quick. Oh God. oh, God, that just because somebody is down and just because somebody is broken and just because somebody has gone through something and just because they have made some mistakes and just because they have made some failures and just because they have done something that you didn't like and was not popular, it doesn't mean that God condemns them. Man puts condemnation on people, not God. For now there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not of the flesh but after the spirit. So God does not condemn. Man does. And the devil helps you to. So you think that somebody has failed. No, what you need to do is make an assessment. Evaluate. Evaluate where they went wrong. Evaluate what happened. Do you know what happened in their past? Do you know the issues that they were going through in their past? Do you know the molestation issues and the abuse that they happened in their past? You never assessed it. You never evaluated it. And the person never went to counseling because they came up in a time in which counseling was not popular. They came up in a time in which, in which therapists was for, for crazy people, not for normal everyday people. But I'm here today to tell you that everybody that has gone through any kind of traumatic experience, you need Jesus and a therapist. You need Jesus and a counselor. I don't get no talk in here today. You're marrying somebody that has never dealt with the issues of their past and has got pent up issues and anger and aggression. They may love you, but they don't know how to process their feelings and their intimacy towards you. And you think that there's something wrong with them and there's nothing wrong with them. They just never had an opportunity to process what was on the inside of them. And guess what, honey? There's something wrong with you. Everybody got something wrong with them. Look at somebody and say, something wrong with you too. You ain't wrapped too tight. Your crazy is just the popular crazy that you know. My crazy you may not be acquainted with. And so you call my crazy crazy and look at your crazy as normal. That just means that you're more acquainted with your crazy than you are with my crazy because you came up in your crazy because that crazy came from your household. And your household taught you how to be that crazy, deal with that crazy, teach that crazy, come up in that kind of crazy, feed that crazy. But your household didn't tell you how to marry that crazy. So marriages are struggling because everybody's crazy is coming to the table and now you got to really prove whether or not for rich or for poor, in sickness and in health, in good and in the bad. What that means? That means that you put your crazy on the table, I put my crazy on the table and I love you in spite of your crazy. In fact, I'm here to help you heal your crazy. And you are here to help me heal mine. Not judge me, not condemn me. Help me, oh God, dear God, I don't know who I'm talking to. Help me to heal it. Because people have been walking around broken for years and they have sacrificed and they have disguised their brokenness with wonderful cars and wonderful households and wonderful portfolios and wonderful investments and wonderful careers and all these degrees, but they're still crazy just because you got six degrees. That just means that you six degrees of crazy. Five degrees of crazy, three degrees of crazy, a GED of crazy. You just got... Everybody, but if you're never here and never understand that all people are broken, oh God, 
then you will not understand that you've got to start from what's left. What is left of you after you have gone through something? Yeah, God. Let me, let me tell you what was left. <laughs> let me tell you what was left of the temple. See, when they came back, they came back and the building was burnt down. The walls of the temple were burnt down. The furniture in the temple was taken and stolen. Everything had been crushed down to its lowest common denominator. What was the common denominator? The foundation. Oh God, the foundation was solid. The foundation was okay. But I'm here today to tell somebody, if your foundation is in Christ, I don't care how crazy the, up stuff, the other stuff get, if you've got a foundation in him, you can start all over again. You can rebuild. You can rebuild. You can rebuild. I just got to do it with him. Zechariah 4 and 10 says this, For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. For those seven, they, they are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro. In other words, you can't despise small beginnings. Because God will always leave you with, the, with something. And it may be little to you, but you can't despise the little that God left you with. Dear God, I, I know you've gone through some hell and hot water. I know, I know you've gone through some rejection and abandonment. But, uh, but I, I want somebody in here to understand that God has, uh, has left you with something. you got something to build on. God has given you some love, some grace to build on, some gift, some purpose to build on, some destiny, some decision to build on. There's something that you can always build on because God will leave you with something. It may be small but it's not insignificant. It may be small, but it's not, it's not any less important. It may be small, but don't despise the small beginning. Don't despise the small thing. There's still something. You built the business, and the business is all the way down to its lowest common denominator. But at least you got something. At least you got, oh God, turn to somebody and say, you got something. You got something. At least you got something. At least you got something. At least you got the breath in your body. At least you got, you, you still can breathe. You still can move. I know you're not as young as you used to be, but at least you got some breath in your body. There's still something for you to do. You may have lost one eye, but at least you got another one. You may have lost one limb, but at least you got another one. You may have lost one friend, but at least you got another one. There is something that everybody has got. You've got something left with. What is left in your hands? Because even though all the trees may get burned down, what never burns up is the seed. The forest can all be leveled by the fire of life, but the forest will always release seed. You will leave a seed. And there is where we can rebuild. Oh, God. Oh, God. Let, 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 let me go on. Here, here's your second point. Rebuilding people takes time. It takes time to overcome. I told the church, I told our staff, I said, I said, when we open up the doors of the church again and, and people are coming back, I, I want everybody to understand that people are not coming back the same because people have gone through all kinds of traumatic situations. I sat down with, with principals and educational leaders and I told them, I said, now, when the kids do come back to school, everybody is not coming back the same. Okay, people, people, people are coming back with all kinds of issues. I've, I've toured a, a, a few schools, and they have increased their counselors on campus. Why? Because they understand the kids are all coming back. You, you saw the, 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 the shooting that happened a few months ago uh, in the school because all kids are coming back. Everybody is coming back with some kind of traumatic experience, and if we have not sat down to help our young people to traverse through it and to deal with it, then we are not helping them to rebuild something. Oh, God. Oh, God. The reason why the reason why sometimes our young people are in the place that they're in is because the old people don't deal with their issues well and so instead of dealing with the issues that's in our household we would prefer to lose ourselves via entertainment and other things that gets us lost from dealing with the truth and the realities of our relationships in our own household. Rebuilding people takes time. It takes time. They are not going to change overnight. It takes time. They didn't get that way overnight. They're not going to get back to where they're supposed to be overnight. It takes time. Look at somebody say, it takes time. 
The number one thing that we need to have with each other is long suffering. I didn't say patience because you need patience for stuff, but you need long suffering for each other. And that's the reason why the word is long suffering. Long suffering literally means that you suffer long with people. How long did Jesus have to deal with Peter? How long did Jesus have to deal with Peter before he saw out of Peter what he always meant, that uh, always knew was in Peter? It took him some time. It took him at least three years to get out of Peter what God already had placed inside of Peter. And you want God to get something out of you and out of your life tomorrow that he has placed in your life today. And I'm here today to tell you it may take some time. It may take some time. One of the issues that I understood as a teacher is that it may take some time for your students to understand so they'll never understand the reason why you taught them uh, what you taught them and the reason why they, you had to teach them to them in the way that they taught it to them. I, I didn't have students come back to me. I taught them in seventh grade, eighth grade, fifth grade, and sixth grade. They didn't come back to me until they were seniors in high school and, uh, and away in college and then they came back and said, Mr. Winfield, thank you so much. Now I understand why you were so hard on us and it took some time. Heck, if I was, uh, if I was insecure about them coming back or insecure about the job that I was doing, waiting on their seal of approval to applaud the work that I was doing, I would have quit a long time ago. But sometimes you're going to have to wait some years before you get applauded for doing the work that God called you to do in somebody's life because it takes, somebody say it takes time. It takes time. It takes time. You can't rebuild me in a day. One day does not rebuild me. My life is so advanced. My life is so vast that it will take more than one day for me to recover from this moment. God, God. Rebuilding takes time. See, you have to discern the seasons because seasons change. Everybody say seasons change. Now, today, it's about 20-something degrees outside. Is that correct? 20-something degrees outside, and I don't see anybody in here who came in here with flip-flops and tank tops. You were not stuck in the summer season. You changed your behavior because the season demanded it. You changed your clothes because the season demanded it. The temperature told you what to do. It told you how to dress. Oh, Y'all don't hear me today. And sometimes in order for you to change your behavior, God will change the temperature of your life. <laughs> oh God, when he, when he wants you to take something off, he will turn up the temperature and make it real hot for you. When he wants you to put something on, he will turn down the temperature and make it real cold for you. Why? Because the temperature will change your behavior. Nothing stays the same. God has a thing where he processes us into new seasons by us understanding that the season has changed. You will never be able to be the same person that you are, oh God, right now because the season will change, honey. And when the season changes, so must you. I was watching what's happening on yesterday because sometimes I get in these nostalgic moments and I start going down memory lane and the, and the you know, the things I watched when I was a kid. And, and, and just in one episode, one, in one episode, I saw my, child, my childhood years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the mama and, and what's happening was was trying to find was trying to find a uh, 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 a dog pet uh, uh, a pet uh, petting uh, service. So she 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 reached up under the cabinet and she pulled out this big book called the Yellow Pages. That's my son. Do you know what a Yellow Page is? He said, No, I don't know what a Yellow Page is. I said, It was Google. Then, then, then she went to the phone and she started, she started, it was a rotary phone. My kids look at rotary phones now like, what is that? It was a phone and it was high technology for the time that it was in. <laughs> then, then, then the next scene came and then somebody else, Roger was trying to make a phone call and he pulled out a piece of paper with a number on it. Because before we ever had cell phones that saved numbers, we wrote numbers down on pieces of paper. But how would you look now 
with a yellow book, a yellow pages, and pieces of paper with numbers on it when everything is on your cell phone. Seasons have changed. So must you. Look at somebody say, the season is changing your life. So must you. I was going to use another example in talking about the Lakers, but I told my wife that I wouldn't because she said not to, and so she's not here, and maybe she's watching, or maybe she's on the plane, but you know, I know she's going to watch, so she's going to call me, and she's going to talk about me if I do, so I'm not going to say nothing, but I'm just going to say that sometimes <laughs> we get caught up on what people were, yeah. and we think that they can do the same things now when the seasons have changed. We're always, me and my son is always having a conversation about, about which generation was the best. That, you, know, you know, I'm an MJ head, you know, and, uh, my, my, Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan, he's the GOAT, he's the GOAT. They're, and they're like, huh, he wasn't that skilled. What? Yeah. You got to be kidding. But how would they know? They didn't live through that time to see the skill that he possessed and the heart that he possessed. They're only looking at what they see and they're judging it by what we tell them. And what you see has more power than what somebody tells you. This is not an argument. <laughs> because in their generation, it is what it is. And the day is going to come in which their kids are going to look at them and call them old. Because seasons change. Y'all still with me? Yeah. Right. What well, you have to discern seasons because they change. The change of the season changes the work of the season. So God allows time to help rebuild people. Stay with me. I only got two more for you. Now, now, now time is an enemy to the procrastinator. Yeah. Time is an enemy to the procrastinator. Time is an enemy to the procrastinator and an ally to the progressor. Oh God. In other words, people who have a heart to progress, time helps you. Because time is connected with technology that will help you to progress. But if you are a procrastinator, then you stop keeping up with the times. And you procrastinate and you become, you become irrelevant to the moments and the moments become irrelevant to you and you can't move on because you think that there's something wrong with your knowledge base and there's nothing wrong with your knowledge base, it's just that you stop learning. Because you kept on procrastinating. And the thing that God called you to do, you kept on waiting on it and procrastinating. Uh, and, and I don't know why you're procrastinating. Sometimes people procrastinate because of fear. Sometimes people procrastinate because of, because of resources. But whatever reason that you give yourself for procrastinating, God never called you to procrastinate. He's always called you to progress. So time, time is an enemy to the procrastinator. That's why some people hate time, because you've been procrastinating all this time. I wish I had more time. You had more time, but you procrastinated. You didn't do nothing with the time that God gave you. And so now the responsibility is way more than what you can handle, but it's not the way that God gave it to you, because he gave you time to progressively get better and prepare for what was coming, but you stood there and didn't do anything with it. And as a result, here you are, overwhelmed with the issues of life when you had time. Oh God, don't get mad at young people who take advantage of their time. Don't get mad at them because they're taking advantage of their time and you've been procrastinating with your old self. You've been sitting there giving yourself all kinds of excuses for you not to progress. The Bible declares that there was a remnant that came out of Babylon and went into Jerusalem, but there was a remnant that stayed. Here are the two excuses that they used. There are some that used the excuse of their age, and they said that, and you know, it's 900 miles. I'm not going to go 900. I'm too old, baby, to go 900 miles. I, I'm too old to make that trip. I'm too old to change. I am too old to make that journey. I'm too old to work like that. I am too old. I am too old. So therefore, they stayed right there in Babylon because they felt like they were too old. And then there was another people, another family that says, I got too many young people with me. I got too many babies. We can't make that trip because they're too young. And so you had two ideas. You had one that said that I'm too old, therefore I won't move. And you had somebody that said I'm too young, therefore I won't move. And so you young people are sitting there and waiting on somebody to give you something. But ain't nobody going to give you nothing. You're going to have to move, honey. You're going to have to move in order for something to be attracted to you. You cannot sit still and expect God's favor to fall on you. 
Favor does not fall on people who are stagnated. Favor falls on people who are moving towards something. I don't know what I want to do in my life, so I'm just going to sit right here. No, do something until you know what to do. Y'all don't hear me today. I can't get no talk. Everybody wants to wait until you know. I, I, I'll do something when I know. i do something when I know. You'll never know until you know, and you won't know until you do. Do something. Because maybe the thing that you do is not the thing that you will do, but it's the thing that leads you to the thing that you will do. Sometimes you got to do what you don't want to do in order for you to do what God has called you to do. No, I got that part right. Peter was fishing, fishing, fishing for years before Jesus came along and said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. But he didn't find Peter at home laughing it up and taking a nap and getting drunk at the clubs and kicking it. No, he found Peter working. I know he didn't like the work, but that's okay, honey. Work it until God gives you something better. That's the principle. Not waiting. What are you doing with your life? I'm just waiting. What are you waiting on? I don't know, but I'm just waiting. I got a principle in my house. My sons know it. If a man don't work, simple as that. Can I? I don't know. Can you? How much money you got? But dad, you got money. Yeah, that's right. I got money. I worked for it. What you got? What you bringing to the table? See, when you were a baby, <laughs> you didn't have to bring nothing to the table. <laughs> I brought it. But now that you're old, now that you're older, and now that you're able-bodied, now that you're strong, now that you're virile, now I need for you to start bringing something to the table. When your mama comes here with them groceries, don't you sit there on your blessed assurance acting like the food is just for us to. You better get up and... Y'all don't hear me today. See, I know y'all got kids in your house and y'all let them sit there while you bringing in groceries and you slaving bringing in groceries and they just sitting there watching you slave. No, honey, and even if you don't have that, you got some strength in your arms. Show something to this meal. <laughs> so, so into it. Here is, here, is, here is time because time can become an enemy. Here's, here, here's your third one. Here's your third one. Now, this is powerful. When the Bible says that when they get to Jerusalem, there is a generation that is crying out because they remember the old. There's another generation that's crying out because they are hopeful about the future. It's a new opportunity. It's a new possibility. Because rebuilding people needs a progressive revelation. A progressive revelation. If you run up on somebody from your high school years and they are the same exact person that they were when y'all were in high school and you have changed, how frustrated will you be? How long will you stay around them? We can only talk about what was only for a short period of time before we got to move on from what was into what it's going to be. I can't talk about how my football years were because I'm 48 years old. Ain't no more football for me. I can only watch it and be a quarterback on the couch. But I'm not about to go out there and put on pads and a helmet and knee pads and all that stuff. And they don't even wear knee pads no more. And wear all that stuff and, and, and get out there and hit somebody. I am 48 years old. I don't even heal the same. So I'm not going to talk about what was. I'll talk about what will be. Because now my life is in what will be, not what was. Y'all still with me? So now every season, I need a progressive revelation. The Bible says, the Bible says that where there is no vision, the people perish. That word vision comes from the Hebrew word kazan. It means progressive revelation. Where there is no progressive revelation, people perish because they stay the same and they don't see the next thing that God has in store for them. And if you stay the same in the old thing that God did for you in the past, then you will start creating monuments and, and, and the moments of your life becomes monuments and you stay there and you 
start worshiping the monument because the monument becomes your idol when God has already changed and shifted and God has already moved and he's trying to get you to do the same but you won't do the same because you have no progressive revelation you have nothing in your life that tells you that you are not the same person I'm not the same person I went through too much to be the same person I've gone through too much hell to be the same person Jesus won't even be the same person when he dies and go to Calvary and he is crucified on Calvary the Bible says that he's laid in the tomb for three days he don't come out of it the same he is God and there is a progressive revelation that he gives to all of us because he changes look at somebody and say you're gonna have to change you're gonna have to change you need a progressive revelation of your life you are not the same what can you do stop talking about what you can't do anymore what can you do I can't do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. Because that season is gone. It's gone. Let it be gone, honey. Now what can you do? What can you do? What has God given you to do right now? If you keep on talking about what you lost and keep on talking about what you can do, you will always sink into the place of depression and depression eventually will turn into suicide. Either suicidal thoughts or suicide and killing your future. But when you understand that God has given you a future, that means that you understand that what you're doing right now, you won't be doing it forever. Fight will fight for a short period of time players will play for a short period of time and then they're gonna have to move on because you cannot be on the stage all the days of your life somewhere along the way you're gonna stop being the sage on the stage and you're gonna start turning into a mentor in somebody's moment somewhere along the way you're gonna have to stop being the center of your attraction and you're gonna have to make somebody else the center of attraction somewhere along the way I'm gonna stop preaching like this I'm not going to do it like this all the days of my life. Are you kidding me? No. I'm going to get a wrench. And me and First Lady are going to have a wrench. And, and we are going to create a wrench for those families who have been dealing with ministry and they had no moments of recreation and we're going to invite them on the ranch and we're going to give uh, get professionals that's going to come to give life to their life and to their ministry and to their marriages and to their kids and we're going to help them to be able to tra traverse through the vicissitudes of ministry because I got a vision that is beyond where I am. I'm going to start helping people with the issues that I struggle with. Y'all don't hear me today. With the stuff that calls me great pain I'm going to turn it into power and use it to help deliver somebody else because I need a progressive revelation in my life and so do you stop looking at the issues of your life that you had a nervous breakdown when you were this and you had a molestation issue when you were that and you got raped when you were that stop turning that into you being a victim and turn it into you having a victorious situation that you can help somebody else to not go into that or help somebody else to come out of it Moses go back to Egypt when I go back I never go back the same Oh God, when Moses left Egypt, he left Egypt as a prince of Egypt. When he goes back, he goes back as the shepherd of the Most High God. Y'all don't hear me today because your life will never be the same. I'm here today to tell somebody there's still something for you to do. In your life, in the season that you're in right now, there is a progressive revelation that God has called you to do. There is something specific and cut to the continuity of the issues of your past, cut to the continuity of the, of the wisdom that you have accumulated over the years, something right now for you to do. If you're going through through grief and you've gone through grief there's somebody going through grief that needs your wisdom how do you come out of that y'all don't hear me today do you know that it's by God that you came out of that situation do you know it's by God that you came out of your Babylons that you came out of your confusion that you came out of your Egypt that you came out of your situations and God is giving you wisdom to deal with somebody else who's trapped in their situation and he's turned you into a Moses He's turned you into a Deborah. He's turned you into a Samuel. He turned you into somebody that can bring somebody else out. But the reason why we don't is because we suffer from comparison issues. And the spirit of comparison feeds the mind of complacency.
You compare your life to somebody else's life. You're looking at the Bible, not, not the Bible, but, but uh, I read uh, certain journals and they said that the reason why the mental health issue has increased in people's lives is because they're not doing anything except on social media. And if they stay on Instagram long enough, they even get more depressed because what you don't understand is that you're comparing your life to somebody else's Photoshop. And your life is looking ugly, and their life is looking pretty, but they manipulated it before they put it in public. Y'all don't hear me today. Oh, God, their marriage ain't that perfect, honey. Stop. Stop acting like, I want us to be loved like I want us to No, no, you don't. You want your own because you don't know what hell they're going through behind the screen. I'm, I'm going to preach one day what happens behind the screen. Because you're comparison comparing your life to somebody else, and comparison is the food for the complacent. So you start giving yourself excuses as to the reason why you can't progress. That those people over there, they were special, but you've gone through too much. You've got too much stuff. You've got too many issues. Not even knowing their story. I'm sorry, I, I, had, I, had a, I had a family member to call me, and he started calling me and talking about, you know, and I said, I said, look, 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 hey, 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 hey. Now, if you're about to have a pity party, don't invite me. I'm not here to have a pity party with you. I'm here to help you, walk with you on how to figure this thing out so we can walk along the way. I'm here to journey with you, not to stay in your pity party. So if you want to stay, cut me off, don't call me, but when you are ready to progress, give me a call and I will walk with you through it because I understand that the only way that I can save you is that you don't fight me. Oh, uh, y'all, y'all hear me? And see, see, uh, they, they they tell lifesavers, those who are lifesavers, or those who are lifeguards, they tell them that that you're gonna have to almost knock the person out, because because while you're trying to save them from drowning, they're gonna be fighting you while you're trying to save them. Because when you are in trauma, you can discern when somebody is trying to help you or hurt you. Y'all don't hear me today. So sometimes you gotta help knock a person out. I mean, you know, lifeguard. I mean, I'm, I mean <laughs> life is, that's figurative and that's metaphorical. I'm not telling you to knock somebody out. I am telling you that sometimes you're going to have to give them truth. Uh. Stop sugarcoating. We insulate our kids and insulate our relationships and listen to each other. Tell. Oh, God. <laughs> Tell with no spin. Tell the truth. Shoot from the hip. That's what I used, I used to love. I, I, I still love it. I, I had some uncles. I had some men in my family. Boy, they would tell you the truth. Now, it would come out all wrong. There was nothing nice about it. There was a whole lot of expletives. There was a whole lot of cussing that was around it. But dear Lord, you got the picture. There was no ambiguity about where they stood. I mean, it was right. It was here is where you understood. We live in a day and an age where nobody knows where they stand with you. You better tell somebody the truth. Tell them. They need it. There's a truth that you do know that makes you free. I got to stop. I got to stop. Rethinking you is rebuilding you. Rethinking you is rebuilding you, and rethinking you takes courage. Look at somebody and say, you're going to have to rethink you. Rethinking you is rebuilding you, and rethinking you takes courage. I've got to rethink me. <laughs> because the thoughts that I have about me is based on the experiences that I have had. What happens if my experience has lied to me? <laughs> what happens if your experiences have lied to you? That your experiences have called you something that that's not what God called you. What happens if, if the children of Israel are in Babylon and they grow up in Babylon, birthed in Babylon, and they start calling themselves Babylonians. 
They called themselves Babylonians, but that's not what God called them, which is the reason why God gave them an opportunity to go back to Jerusalem, because they're not Babylonians, they're Jews. So they define themselves by their upbringing, not necessarily by what God had instituted before they even were born. God. They don't know what they were before they got into Babylon. They were called Jews before they got into Babylon. And then in Babylon, they grew up in Babylon, and they became Babylonians. And then here comes Cyrus the Persian, and then, and then they, 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 they conquer Babylonian, uh, the Babylonian Empire, and then they go into Jerusalem. Well, now what happens if, if the thing that conquers me, or the thing that conquers the thing that's conquering me, I identify myself by that. That means that they're not only Babylonians, now they become Persians. Do you know how confused that person is? Because you called yourself by your experience and not what God called you? <laughs> your experiences do not define you. They're only there to help reveal you. It will tell you who you are not. So never place the value of what's outside of you over the substance that's within you. I'll stop with this. This is the whole point of this lesson. The building that they were rebuilding was never going to be as grand as Solomon's temple. Solomon used gold Silver. He had the cedars of Lebanon as pillars. Everything was meticulously done. He had the best of everything. The temple of Solomon looked glorious on the outside. But God said to Hagar, Hagar, give them a word for me. That even though it looked good on the outside, the glory of the latter house is going to be greater than the glory of the former house. Why, Lord? Doesn't that house look better? And the Lord is saying that house looked better. But the glory of this house is not in how it looks. <laughs> the glory of this house is in who it will entertain. Because the, 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 the temple of Solomon never entertained the Son of God. Y'all give me just a moment. Uh. This temple is going to actually see the very Son of God walk in it. <laughs> Whereby the other temple looked good on the outside and had gold and furnishings on the, out, on the inside. It didn't have as much glory as this is going to have on the inside. In other, words, in other words, the value of this temple is not in how it looked. It's in what it contained. The value that's in your life is not in how you look. It is in what you contain and who you contain because ye are the temple. Come on, come on, hear me. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Power of God is in you. I consider these present sufferings not worthy to be compared with the glory that is in me. Oh, y'all don't hear me today. There is great glory in you and you're starting to put so much value on what you drive, on where you live, on the clothes you have on your bodies. So what, you got on red bottoms, blue bottoms, orange bottoms, or black bottoms? It don't matter, honey. If your spirit ain't right, what? You can have all the money in the world, but if your spirit ain't right, yeah, 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 you, you can have the greatest marriage in the world. When I say the greatest, I mean that y'all are flying all over the place, but y'all still don't love each other? What good is it for you to have all of the things that people will call you great at having, but you have nothing on the inside of you 
Because with God, God does not build from the outside in. He builds from the inside out. So if you're going to be able to rebuild people, stop criticizing them for their outsides. And be smart enough to be invited inside. I'm not preaching sermons anymore. Because sermons for some people and for some preachers and for some parishioners have become momentary entertainment moments that calls for you to, with the entertainment, forget about the trauma that you have faced and does not arm you with the methods and the tools needed and necessary for you to journey through the trauma and become a better person. You got to rebuild from the inside out. Everyone standing on your feet. From the inside out. From the inside out. Building was never about the temple. Watch. Here is the message. I asked for the children of Israel to come out of Egypt and come to the mountain, go to the wilderness so that they can worship me. There was no building because God can live anywhere. The first time that they met God was on a mountain. It wasn't a building. And then he told Moses, build a tabernacle because the tabernacle is supposed to be a sign and a signature and a type and shadow of how I want to dwell with you and in you. Then the tabernacle turned into Solomon's temple because David wanted to build a permanent place, a stationary place for God to dwell. And God told David, it's good that you have it in your heart to do it, but you're not going to even do it. I'll let your son do it, Solomon, because you're a man of war and, and people of war can't build a temple for me because I'm a prince of peace. Peace is going to be in this temple. And so Solomon builds the temple based off of the stuff that David accumulates for him to build it. And he puts music there. He puts all of that stuff there. But you can have music in your temple but not have the glory of God there. And just because there is music in the temple, that don't mean that God is there. <laughs> because God never wanted to just dwell in buildings. Why? Because a building don't move. <laughs> he wanted to dwell in people all along. And so he allowed for Solomon's temple to be destroyed. Watch. Only to be rebuilt. <laughs> Look at how all of those buildings changed. And just because it was done, it doesn't mean God was done with it. And so he allowed for, for Ezra to go back and rebuild this temple. Because it's a sign in the signature that if I'm able to rebuild buildings, how much more will I give the world to rebuild you? Because it was never about buildings, it was always about you and the presence of God dwelt in buildings until Jesus comes. And Jesus says to his disciples, it is expedient that I go away because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the comforter will not come. Yeah. So I got to go away. Why? Because I'm trying, to, I'm trying to put the Spirit of God in you. And then Paul comes along to get the revelation that says, so let this mind be. <laughs> come on. Let this mind be where? In you. In you. The mind that was also in Christ Jesus. You don't need, no, the Bible says in the book of, uh, of Peter that, that, that you don't have need of a teacher to teach you. For the Holy Spirit is in you. We're going to have a fast. We're going to start our fast this Wednesday. Our Daniel fast, a 12-day fast from, from, from Wednesday the 19th to, to Sunday the 30th. And we'll culminate with, with communion. And I'll be, I'll, I'll be short and bald-headed. If I know, people are going to call me. Well, pastor, can I eat this? If you got to ask.
and I drink this? Well, if you got to ask, because we know. <laughs> how many of y'all, how many of y'all, uh, when, when you know, you know you're wrong, you know you're wrong, and you walk away and you got this thing on the inside of you that's like convicting you, like, oh my gosh, I know I was wrong. How many of y'all, how many of y'all felt that? There was nobody there telling you, now you know you're wrong. There was no preacher, no teacher, no prophet there. It was just you and the Lord. How many of you have been walking down and say, and, and you, you hear a still small voice saying, you need to pray? You, you, you don't have, because God is trying to rebuild you from the inside out. That's why we're fasting. That's why we're praying. It's consecration. Why? Because God is trying to rebuild us from the inside out. From the inside out. Because something was broken inside of us. How many of you would say, just be honest, how many of you would say that this pandemic shifted you in some way, shape, form, or fashion? Either your faith you ask the Lord, Lord, why are you doing this? Lord, dear Lord, I am so tired of this. You even said, Lord, please, could you please? It was, why don't you do something? Shook your faith. Rocked what you already knew. I thought good people don't die until good people died. <laughs> Lord, what are you doing in this? And he is steadily saying, I want to rebuild you from the inside out. Oh, God. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. You may be watching and streaming on live. I want to pray for you and pray over you right now. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you, Father, for who you are creating me to be. And I know, Father, that because seasons change, you're changing me too. And because your spirit is residing on the inside of me, I move with your spirit. And so I pray in the name of Jesus, Father, that you would lead me and guide me, that you would help me to be able to have a new vision, to have new strength to have greater mobility. That you would rebuild me from the inside out. That you would rebuild my brother and my sister from the inside out. That you would rebuild everything, Father, that has been dilapidated or destroyed through the fires of life. I pray, Father, for families, for relationships. I pray for those who are single. I pray for those who are married. I pray for those who have children, oh God. I pray, Father, for every person under the sound of my voice. And I ask and pray that by your spirit, you would rebuild your people so that the glory of this latter house would be greater than the former. Help us to progressively get better. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Now, can you do me a favor and give God like 10 seconds of praise just if you felt God speaking to you? Come on. Father, we love you. Thank you. Thank you for your word. 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 Now listen, our elders and ministers are going to be at the table. If you're here today and you say, I don't know Jesus as my Lord and personal Savior, you may be watching and streaming on live. Maybe you say, I don't know Jesus as my Lord and personal Savior, and you need to come to know him. If that is you, if that's you and you're watching online, you go into the Zoom room. The information is at the bottom of your screen. There is an elder, a minister there waiting on you to walk you through this journey. If you're here today and you're sitting here, standing here, and you say, I don't know Jesus, I want to be baptized, or I want to connect with this church and find out more about this church. If that's you, then immediately after service, I want you to go to any one of those circular tables. There is an elder and a minister there to greet you, to walk you through this. We are here for you. Listen, we're going to start our fast on this coming Wednesday. 
We're starting our fast this coming Wednesday. It's a Daniel fast. It's for 12 days. Why? Because 12 is the number of foundation. It's the number of foundation. Everybody say, I got something left. God is always giving you something left to build on, and we're going to build on the foundation of what God speaks to us. Three things, three areas of our devotion is going to be consecration. Everybody say consecration. Uh, clarity, everybody say clarity. And communion, everybody say communion. I have devised a devotional for you. I created a devotional to serve as a guide that every day, there's a scripture that we'll read together. You may have your own that you want to read, and that's fine. But, but every day, there's something that I've put in there for us to read together, a prayer to pray, and a daily confession to make with some commentary that's going to help us to understand the text for the day and kind of guide our thoughts while we are journeying through this 12-day prayer and consecration. Remember, if there is no prayer, it is only a diet. So we pray and fast because that's our way of saying to God, God, I'm expecting a powerful rebuild this year. And I want to be ready for what you want me to do. I want you to work through me. Anybody have that prayer? I want you to work through me this year. There's some great stuff, okay? So all of that information is going to be on our website. All of the devotionals, all of this stuff is going to be on our website at tphfw.org. Or you can go to the app, download the app, because all of it is going to be on the app or is going to be on our website, but you will have it in your hands. There should be no question. If there is a question about, Pastor, can I eat this and all that stuff, I, I, I've attached a website that you can go to. I am not your Yellow Pages, and I am not your Google. Daniel Fast. <laughs> it's what it is. It's fruits and vegetables. That's all it is. Fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables. That's all it is. And water. That's me. Now, y'all was say, man, can we, have, can we have juice from concentrate? Or how about we have the juice and the vegetable juice? Can we squeeze it and make it? Fruits and vegetables. What you do with your fruit is what you do with your fruit. <laughs> if you want to squeeze it and shish kebab it, it's fruit. <laughs> all right? So, so all of that information is going to be on our website and on our app, make sure you download it. I love you with the love of the Lord. And let me tell you something, let me tell you something, this is what I'm excited about. I'm so excited that I get an opportunity to do this year with you, to live this year with you, to journey this year with you, because I'm excited about what we will all discover together. Amen. I love you. Pa uh, I was about to say Pastor Jay. Ryan, take us home. God bless you. I'll see you guys next week. Amen. 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 Uh, there we go. Okay. Amen. If you all enjoyed that word and got something from the word that Pastor Winfrey just dropped on us, can you give God praise and thanks and glory for that word? Let me tell you, thank God. Even online, if you receive something, go ahead and put a hashtag rebuilding people in the chat. Let us know that you received a, a great word and it was on time for me because fasting ain't easy I love burgers and chicken and 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 french fries and and pizza I love all of that and, and just knowing that uh, going through a fast helps with the rebuilding process makes me that much more excited to go into this uh, 12 day fast once again that's starting on Wednesday January 19th all the way through January 30th um, so I encourage you all join in with the fast if, if you if you receive the word about rebuilding people and how God is going to rebuild you and you really want to see it through join us for this 12 day fast and I encourage you to download the app the website is there but it's so much easier on our Potter's House of Fort Worth app so make sure you download the app so that you'll have all of the information about the fast the, the daily devotionals and the prayers and the confessions that we'll be going through each day of the fast amen 
Um, and just a quick reminder, don't forget our Wednesday night Bible studies will resume Wednesday, January 19th at 7 p.m. And it's only going to be online. So make sure you plug into our Facebook and, and watch and join us as we go deeper in our relationship with Christ. Also, our mobile food pantry. First one of 2020. Make some noise for that. Where we are able to bless all the families in the community of Fort Worth. It's happening um, February 5th at 9 a.m. to 11 uh, p uh, a.m. as well. And then don't forget, join us, log in, follow us on our app, um, also uh, on the website so that you all can get more information about our small groups, key majors, men's ministry, marriage ministries, even the students. If you have a student in between in the ages or in the grades of the 12th grade all throughout middle school and junior high, join us for the fire culture because we got things planned, big things planned for all the students all across the DFW and in the world, okay? So you want to join us and join the firehouse and the fire culture as we go deeper in God as students, okay? Um, I want to say a quick prayer and then you, we, we, you all will be dismissed to go home. Father, we love you and we thank you for an on-time word. I pray that as you are rebuilding us, Lord God, continue to uh, give us the strength the discipline and, and the patience that we need to go through the process, Lord God. I pray that as we leave this place, that we never leave your presence, that we take you with us wherever we go and within whatever encounters that we have throughout our weeks, Lord God. Keep us strengthened, keep us whole, and keep us in, in, in your peace. And this is in your son Jesus' name. Amen. We love you all. If you're watching online, thank you all so much for watching and tuning in. Have a blessed week. Hello, family. This is Pastor Winfield here. And I just want to say that we are so excited that you decided to become a member here at the Potter's House of Fort Worth. Now, I know that oftentimes, especially in, in churches today, we don't talk or have viable conversations about the importance of membership and what it means for you as an individual. What does it mean for your family to become connected to, to the things that happens here at the Potter's House? But I want you to know that there is something spiritual that happens uh, when people connect to the work that God is doing through us here at the Potter's House of Fort Worth. See, Ephesians the fourth chapter says that the body grows by what every joint supplies that there is something on the inside of you that is graced to supply us with something that helps us to grow. And by virtue of relationship and reciprocity, there is something on the inside of us that is graced to be able to help you to grow. See, the purpose of connection and partnership and membership is growth and development because we are here to equip you. We are here to empower you so that you can do the work that God is calling for you to do, to disciple you, to walk with you along the way, to do life together so that through the vicissitudes of life, ups and the downs, the ins and the outs, that every season there is a word with your name on it, a word that feeds your destiny, a word that feeds your purpose, a word that grows you, that disciples you, helps you to become everything that God is calling for you to become. See. If people are just on the outside looking in, they don't get all of the organic um, uh, nutrients that's within the context of the body. But those who are connected to the body, the services, the, the ability to be able to serve you and your families in, in a very significant and real way, uh, the ability to be able to connect beyond just a worship service, that's what you get. And that's what we are committed to giving to you. So I want you to know that just like there were disciples that left Jesus and did not walk with him along the way, they missed three years of revelation, three years in which he was doing miracles, signs, and wonders in the earth that they totally missed because they were not connected. Three years in which he was multiplying fish and and, and loaves and feeding the multitudes, and the disciples were able to see all of the miracles that happened because they were engaged and involved and connected. Well, my brother and my sister, I am praying and hoping that you would see all of the miracles that God does through this ministry, through this church, and 
pieces of those miracles would fall into your own household so that you could see how being a part of this church and this ministry enriches your faith, develops you as a disciple, and opens up your mind and your heart to the possibilities of a higher purpose and a higher calling that all of us should walk in. Well, thank you so much for being a part of this church, for literally connecting and engaging with us. I invite you as the pastor to be as involved as you possibly can and to be faithful to that particular call and that involvement because we're going to be faithful to you. This is Pastor Winfield. Until we meet again, until I see you, until I meet you face to face, may God bless you with abundance of grace and mercy.